This is Laurel from Santiago at the Bus Rapid Transit Center. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our May A webinar. And I'm very pleased to introduce Bill, Pauline, and Fabrizio, who are in South Africa, who are going to be talking about BRT in South Africa. And if you have questions, you're welcome to type them in, and we'll, we'll take them all at the end. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Buenos dias. It's Bill starting off. I'm going to give you a bit of background to the development of BRT in South Africa, um, particularly with reference to some of our flagship projects in the metropolitan areas. And then we're going to turn over to Pauline and Fabricio to talk about some of our secondary cities um, so that one can see the contrast and so on. But you must remember we're late starters. We only began this exercise in around 2008. Just by way of outline, we've, we've got four things we'd like to talk about, apart from the background. We'd like to explain to you how extensive BRT interventions are in South Africa, um, deal specifically with Cape Town, uh, the mother city of, of Cape Town, the, the first settlement, uh, first colonial or European settlement, if you like, on the southern tip of Africa. And then we'll go on to the advantages of developing public transport in uh, early stages of urban settlement in, in medium-sized towns. Uh, the case of Rustenburg, which is a city on, in the interior, in the inner part of South Africa. We com commenced our, our, our exercise in 2006, and it largely coincided with the uh, 2010 FIFA World Cup. The idea was that, in fact, what we developed in the way of uh, BRT systems would be catalytic for the reform and upgrading of public transport in, the, in South Africa or the Republic of South Africa, RSA, as it is commonly known. And uh, there were nine cities uh, which were designated to host the World Cup. Um, I think there are 12 in Brazil, so we were slightly more modest, but most of South Africans think we overdid it, and uh, perhaps we are going to live with the, with the costs of that for a few generations to come. Um, conditional grant funds were made available to assist the cities uh, to develop these systems, uh, which were to be legacies. But actually, in the event, we started rather late, and, and as some of you may know, the planning takes the best part of two years, so we weren't really in a position to to implement uh, much before the CONCAF or Confederations Cup in 2009. So really, of the nine cities, only Johannesburg and to a lesser extent uh, Cape Town succeeded in pro providing BRT by 2010. Moving on then, um, these are some of the uh, legacy projects. Uh, in this particular slide on the left-hand side, you see the 90,000-seater stadium in Johannesburg, which is known, was known as Soccer City, which was designed in the form of an African cooking pot, a calabash. The BRT is seen in the... Hold on a second, Bill. Yeah, yeah. We can't, we can't see, see your, your slides. Oh, have you seen none of them? Yeah, they, we, they haven't been advanced. All right, well, we'll work on that. If you'll bear with us for one second. La emisión está comenzando. Todos los asistentes están en modo de solo escucha. It's working now. Perfect. Now we can see them. Okay, well you didn't miss, miss much because the previous slides were mostly verbal and I've given you the, the commentary of that. Now what you're looking at is the first of the pictorial slides, um, and this is to, to exemplify some of the legacy type projects which were developed for 2010. Um, in the top left of this particular picture is the Johannesburg Main Stadium, which is known as Soccer City, uh, which is between Soweto and the CBD of Johannesburg. 
the BRT runs, and, and this is in a construction stage, in the foreground in front of the, uh, in front of the stadium. Um, and it just gives you an example in this particular slide of some of the infrastructure that was built as part of the system. Um, on the right-hand top is a typical Johannesburg station with buses loading for Soc Soccer City. And remember, we drive on the left-hand side of the, of the road here. And the bottom slide shows a typical uh, a double station with, with buses loading uh, in the direction of Soccer City. Um, just to reinforce the fact that we were on time, and this is a shot of match time at Soccer City during the World Cup. Um, looking at the extent of the interventions in South Africa, uh, let me remind you we started roughly in 2008. We currently are working in 13 cities actually. The ones depicted in red are those where we, we currently have operations in place. Uh, and in those two centers, which are Cape Town and Johannesburg, we're working in, in single corridors at the moment which are busways with quite extensive um, feeder and distributor services. In both cities there are something in the order of 27 kilometers um, of, of busway, busway trunk services. We have a few cities, um, the, blue, uh, the blue ones, which are currently in construction, which includes Rustenburg, which we'll get onto a little later, and the, and the capital or, of Pretoria. We have one other city which is implementing already, shown in yellow, whatever color you can see there, orange maybe, and that is Nelson Mandela, or what was known as Port Elizabeth. All the rest, shown in green, are in the various stages of planning, either the operational plan, business plan, um, marketing plan, or, or, or even doing uh, detailed designs. Just an interesting shot, which some of you may be familiar with, which comes from the IDTP, recent publication on best practice in national support for urban transport, the first part evaluating country performance. It's quite interesting, in fact, uh, that this uh, presentation by Walter Hook shows the position in, in eight cities that they selective, which they casually indicate covers more than... <laughs> 50% of the world's population, but of course that includes China, so uh, we don't count ourselves amongst the most popular nations. But what's very interesting is that our um, uh, rapid transit ratio, which is their measure that they use for measuring uh, performance, is 2, which is 2 kilometers of rapid transit per million urban population. But the interesting thing in that particular graph is it shows the growth in transit compared to investment costs by country. And of course, South Africa looks quite impressive along with Indonesia, but that's because we're building cheap systems. In other words, BRT. We're not building, we're not building subways and metros and things like that, which, which makes our performance look, look great when you measure it in terms of kilometers of rapid transit per billion uh, dollars of, of expenditure. So there we sit at 166.7. But it, it, it's interesting and we use this nicely to convince our politicians, yeah, this is the way to go and let's do more BRT. Look how well South Africa is doing. Uh, just to go on to the, the, the Cape Town story now, you'll see the map on the left showing the position of Cape Town. Probably most of you know it. Um, in the, in, in, in the diagrammatic showing the network, this is the planned network. On the left-hand side, you'll see where it, where it converges, which is the Cape Town Central Business District. And for those of you who know it, the blue is Table Bay, and to the south of that is Table Mountain, for those of you who know Cape Town. Um, basically, what we've done is we've, we've, uh, we've, we've got to the stage where we've constructed Phase 1 corridor which runs to the north. It's a dedicated trunk of about 27 kilometers, and it serves um, a suburban area known as Tableview and beyond to one of the old uh, apartheid uh, settlements, which were placed, as you know now, out of sight and out of mind. Let's go forward. 
that that is the initial network. I'm showing you the the dedicated BRT in the center, which is on a highway known as the R27. And then there are feeder services in the suburb known as Ta uh, Tableview. And within the city itself, there are distribution services uh, going through the center towards uh, one of the high density areas uh, to the south known as gardens and then into the waterfront which people who have been tourists to South Africa will know about. So that's that's basically where we stand at the moment. And um, one of the features in fact is that we've we've really gone for for high quality in terms of our BRT. We want to ensure that it's car competitive and in this particular uh, application in the first phase one we are serving a middle income community and we are experiencing quite considerable uh, modal shifts from private cars onto the bus service which which is important. We didn't just want to serve low income communities of which we have massive numbers as, as you all probably know. Uh, what I would like you to note is that that red route there is the trunk which is a ded dedicated trunk built with continually reinforced concrete Unfortunately, it doesn't serve all that many people along the route. You can see why. The densities are fairly low and we have this wetland abutting the western butway. But you, you should notice the quality of the infrastructure, which you can see quite clearly uh, in the slide on the bottom right. Likewise, in the suburb, you can see a shot there of uh, the quality of the, the, the system. You, you're looking at an intersection. Uh, along the dedicated lane in the in, in the township of or the suburb of Tableview. You can see the red lanes uh, divided by a median. In that median are footways and cycleways which meander through landscaped uh, territory. Uh, you can see the quality of the station is there in, in, in the in the median. You can see park and ride sites at various points along the route. And you can notice the quality of the roadway markings, the pedestrian crossings, and so on. So, so really Cape Town has done a wonderful job in, in trying to develop a real quality BRT system. This is just a shot of the sort of challenge we face. Uh, I'm showing you one of the depots uh, which exists on the um, suburban end of, of that particular network, but right next door uh, in the background you'll see an informal settlement and the big challenge here is of course you cannot get a BRT through a uh, dense settlement like that. Not that it's dense in terms of population, but it's dense in terms of uh, low-rise shack structures, which is very challenging when it comes to, to developing uh, systems. These areas have hitherto been served by, by minibus taxis. Um, so far, the, 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 the patronage is building up. Uh, this shows the patronage up until December th uh, 2013, which in that particular corridor had built up to nearly 20,000 passengers per, per, per day. Uh, we understand now that they've opened a lot more feeder services and distribution services, that these numbers are approaching 50,000 for that particular corridor per day, which we, we don't think is too bad considering they, they've only been operating for about uh, 18 months to two years. And as I mentioned before, it's, it's very low density. So the signs are quite good. Um, just a few shots of the typical infrastructure. That is a, uh, a typical articulated 18 meter bus operating on the network with a station behind it. This is one of our feeder buses, the Optair, a 9 meter bus, which uh, has a capacity of 50 passengers, 25 seated. And you can see the sort of quality of the, 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 the stops and the signage uh, adjacent to that. Um, one of the quite significant features is the fare collection. Um, in January 2014, uh, the transport for Cape Town was the official winner of the prestigious International MasterCard Award for Best Bank Card Ticketing Scheme. Um, and it's really put Cape Town, transport for Cape Town on the map as the world leaders in 
uh, EMV low value payment, uh, anonymous con contactless card implementation in the transit environment. So we, we, we're particularly pleased with this. I'll just close off what I have to say with a few shots which show the validators. Uh, can you do that for me? Yeah, there, there are the validators which are on all the stations. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, the EMV card, which you see as Master Visa, whatever, can be uh, can be presented to, to the validator. One gets a summary of, of the finance or the uh, the money that's on the card. In this case, it's 147 rand, which we convert into into mover points. The next one, and the next one shows from the left how you can read your statement, reading up from the bottom. Uh, the person whose card was presented here had a balance of, I think if my eyesight is correct, and yours, you can probably read this, around 30, 30 Rand. Uh, they took a trip which cost them five, 5 Rand, 6 Rand 20. It shows the balance being adjusted, and then another deposit, and so on. So these validators show, give you mini statements, they give you card details, uh, and so on. And, and we, we're quite proud of these. We think that, in fact, this is really one of the, uh, the most important components. And they are being applied now in Johannesburg and also in, in Durban. Now I'll turn over to Rustenburg to tell you the story of uh, a smaller city, which is still in the planning process. Well, hello. Um, <clears throat> Speaking about um, uh, Rustenburg, first of all, it's important to, to understand that, um, and, and, and you probably are aware of that, that it's not the same to be designing for the big metropoly, that uh, most of the, the, the network is already set with a lot of uh, congestion problems and so on. And with uh, secondary cities, uh, on the other hand, you can find an, an opportunity to really make an interesting and integrated plan uh, of public transport. So one of the, the things that we have identified in the case of Rustenburg, and we will we'll go a little bit on the details in the next slides, is that uh, a project like this one could be uh, the, the catalyst of a, the, for the development of the, the whole area, all the surrounded areas around the, this uh, mid-sized city. Uh, of course, uh, as well, can it help creating another uh, another uh, centers of activity and and helping to reduce the pressure that the big metropolitan areas uh, have. Specifically about Rustenburg, well, we in 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 case of South Africa is the seventh uh, largest city economy, and actually the, uh, even uh, larger than other uh, new metropolitan areas as Buffalo City. Or East London and East London. Um, well, there, there, and, and to give you an idea about the scale of uh, Rustenburg, I, I put this graphic here, and uh, you, we are comparing the city of Rustenburg with the city of Johannesburg, which is more or less the size of the city of Bogota, and it could be like uh, two or three times the size of the city of Guatemala City. Uh, other important element uh, besides the, the, the size and, and the population, specifically for Rustenburg, is, this, um, is uh, uh, some numbers around the, 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 um, the trip mode in, in that city. Uh, for, after doing uh, our, our studies for, the, uh, uh, for, for this uh, transport project, uh, we could identify that, uh, like in many cases uh, in, in Latin America and in Africa, most of the people uh, travel by public transportation and they don't have a, a car. So um, again, uh, a shift in, uh, of mind and ch uh, changing the way that the people think about um, uh, mobility, uh, and, and this has been actually quite a challenge um, in, in the case of Rustenburg. Other important element, and specifically for Rustenburg area, is that um, all, most of the province, the province is a mining 
area. There is a three big groups of mining, uh, and all of them create uh, what we call the, the mining belt. And you can see it in the slide in the bottom, the, the red area mark. And all those mines are uh, more or less uh, platinum. And to give you an idea how important uh, is those mines in, in, in the global context is around 70% of the whole platinum of the, of the world are coming from those mines. So this is going to uh, create a sp specific characteristics for the city, uh, especially in, um, in terms of, of the, of the um, working hours, where in the mines uh, we have different uh, shifts and, and we have actually shifts that happen overnight. So that modifies a little bit the way that we are going to, to, to manage the system. Uh, Rostomer is uh, uh, basically uh, distributed and, and displayed uh, uh, along two, um, two big uh, main axes, creating a, um, a V shape. And basically, those, those two legs of the V are the main corridors of the system. And then we develop uh, um, other two services that complement that, and um, and then and, and create um, the, the the full network. Um, as you can see, there's some numbers about uh, the corridors. We're speaking about thirty-four thousand to fifty in one corridor and thirty thousand to fifty-five passengers uh, direction per, per twelve hours period, and in, in, in both directions. Oh, sorry, in one direction. Then uh, the numbers drop uh, to other corridors. So at the moment in our system, we are proposing two BRT corridors, but there are another, as I mentioned, other, other, other routes that will complement the main roads. They will feed the, the, the main routes, and they will serve other areas of the, of the, of the Rustenburg area. So at the moment, what we have been planning for, for Rustenburg, as I mentioned, is not only a BRT corridors, it's more than that. We were thinking since the very beginning, an integrated public transport network, as is requested uh, by, by, uh, by national government and the Department of Transport. And in our specific case, we are speaking about, about a full flex system which is uh, a little bit different from the uh, typical trunk feeder uh, system that uh, are in, in, in different cities. Uh, there are 24 kilometers of uh, segregated lanes and about 700 kilometers of public transport uh, distributed. Along the corridors, we have 32 stations and all over the network around 600 stops serving 85% of the population, 85 to 90% of the population, and within one kilometer. And um, this BRT, um, as I mentioned, is complemented with other, other uh, the non-motorized transportation scheme that we are developing and some um, uh, projects related with the CBD, with the uh, business district. Uh, making uh, some pedestrian, uh, pedestrian streets and some uh, other areas that can improve the quality of life in the, in that, in, um, in the CBD, which is the area that is, has been abandoned for, for in the past years. This is like, you can see the full system and the numbers uh, that, that we got after our, our studies. We have three different services I mentioned. We have six main routes, which are uh, like what usually are called like trunk corridors. Two are then uh, in segregated lanes, and those are like a uh, mark in, with a green line, if you see the, the draw in the, uh, to the left. Then we have 19 direct services and 26 feeder routes. Um, we are moving 300,000 passengers trips in the whole in the whole system, and our fleet um, is um, a combination of three different types of vehicles. 
65 articulated buses, uh, 438 standard vehicles, 12 meter vehicles, and we uh, are introducing the MIDI buses as well as the city of Cape Town, and there are 61. And that's the, the whole picture uh, for, for, the, for, the, for, the, um, for the city of Rustenburg. Um, I'm going to pass this one. But the other thing that we uh, planned was that the implementation of the, of, the, of the system. And we had divided the project in four phases. Starting with a, a, very, a, with a, um, with a small section, which is uh, in, in the very center, centered part of, this, of, the, of the Rustenburg, and is one of, I would say, one of the, the, the legs of, the, of that V that I was mentioning. Phase two is the extension of that V uh, a little bit up to the north. Phase three is the uh, extension of the V in the other leg. And then phase four, uh, it will be the rest of the, of the network. And you can see the different numbers and, 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 and the fleet that we are considering for one of, um, of each phases and how they are distributed on time. We are now under construction and we have um, the date that we have in mind to start operating is February 2016 for the phase one and then uh, um, 2017 the phase two. About some, some details about our system, uh, well, you can see the, the design of our stations. Uh, the stations, uh, we have a combination of two types of stations, singles and doubles. Obviously, the doubles are the ones that we are allowed to transfer, a close transfer between feeder routes and uh, trunk routes or main routes. Uh, our stations are made of concrete, glass, and, and steel. Uh, uh, as, and among all, all, all other materials, but the, the idea is to uh, we 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 went with a team of architects that try to um, look for a design that uh, integrates very well with the architecture and with the heritage of Rastomer. Our stations are between uh, 4.5 and 6 meters uh, uh, wide, wide, and as um, and 45 meters long in the single station and 90 meters for the double station. And of course, uh, all the stations has uh, all the uh, ITS uh, systems and the AFC since the very, since the very beginning. Inside, uh, we will uh, have an, a kiosk and vending machine for the ticket sale, for the tickets, CCTV cameras and electronic uh, science board. Uh, there's going to be some public seatings for uh, in, inside. And um, and storage room, an IT room, and some restroom for the staff in, in, on each station. <clears throat> One of the, um, in CVD, which is in, uh, the, the point where the two main corridors um, interact, we design what we call the central station, which is a big, uh, big station with uh, 14 bays where we, uh, we can have most of the transfers between the two main corridors with uh, uh, other, other feeder routes and uh, with other services. Um, that station is now um, uh, almost uh, about to start construction. And um, we are, well, as, um, it's not only about the, the, the possibility of, of having these uh, transfers in this point. Actually, central station for, for us has been like a, a trigger of other interventions that can uh, improve the, the, the public realm in, in all, this, uh, all the CVD. To give you an idea of the scale, uh, what you are seeing in the, in, the, in, the, in the top view is more or less 400 meters long uh, by kind of 50 to 50, no, 50 meters um, what? Two city blocks. Yeah. As I mentioned, other interventions are part of this. There's a plan for pedestrianized different streets to regulate, regulate parking. There's a, new, a, a completely new parking policy for the city of Rustenburg. Uh, there is a plan for managing, uh, for managing the freight. All this, new, um, univer uh, all this NMT that I was mentioned, there's a, a completely bicycle scheme 
in not, uh, not only in terms of the cycle tracks, um, but uh, as well with, um, with a, a, a full project related with the NMT. Um, and of course, the universal access, which is one of the requirements from the Department of Transport for each project that are uh, being developed in this country to guarantee a full universal, uh, universal access. Logically, we have a, trans, uh, a transport management center and uh, with all the characteristics that those places has, um, this is um, we we have been uh, uh, lucky that uh, city of Johannesburg and Cape Town they already developed their own uh, TMCs, and now we are just basically kind of um, uh, learning from the mistakes, <laughs> and for the and as well from the 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 the, the, the good ideas that I, they have had in those. In our scheme of non-motorized transportation, um, we uh, did a very interesting uh, research, uh, not only about uh, the possibility of introducing the bicycles as a as a complement uh, um, as a complementary system to the to the BRT. Uh, in in our case, we tried not only to to provide that service in the in the on the stations. The idea is to have a parallel project running and providing uh, access uh, to the whole CBD with different uh, levels of, of infrastructure. Um, at this stage, along the corridors, especially where all the um, segregated lanes are being constructed, the cycle tracks are, being, are, are, already, are already there or are under construction. Uh, universal, uh, universal access, as I mentioned, is one of the requirements in and, and, and and, 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 and Department of Transport has been very, very um, uh, strict in terms that uh, every, uh, all the cities have to provide all the facilities and, uh, and, and guarantee that there's going to be options for uh, this, universal, uh, this universal accessibility. In, in the uh, in the buses in the sta on stations and everywhere, uh, sidewalks and uh, sidewalks and sidewalks and etc. Uh, of course, other component that is uh, important and is part of uh, this uh, new projects is uh, we have um, um, a program for uh, transit-oriented development. Uh, different projects, uh, especially related with all the stations along the corridors and some other projects in the CBD. Um, we have approached with the private sector and explained what the reasons of this. Uh, there's no one specific legislation in Rustenburg about this, so it's, um, and, and, and we are working on that to, to, to propose uh, some changes to promote this mixed-use land projects and all the, the schemes that are related with the transit-oriented developments. Another important element of, of, of um, the, the implementation of these systems in South Africa is that um, uh, the process uh, with, the, um, with the taxi industry or with the operators. Uh, in the case of Rustenburg, parallel with, when we start the design process and all the planning, we start um, having contact with all the taxi industry and the bus industry. And at the moment, we have been moving uh, very well forward with them and at this uh, now we are in the, in the stage of creating the, the the bus operator companies and and be ready to to uh, to um, to be ready to operate in February 2016 some important numbers uh, uh, for us and to, to present is uh, in, in, in Rustenburg um, rapid transport has um, as you can as you can read, as create as expecting to create around five thousand jobs for the next three years, uh, using local materials and as in all the the, the the constructions and even in the in the provision for the for the vehicles, uh, uh, between twenty to twenty five percent of the materials has to be uh, local. Um, uh, other the important element is that well, all the um, we, we, the, the project has provided work 
for different uh, different people in the area and uh, trying to um, create like a database for few, for this future pro uh, jobs that, that, we, that we will that we will have there. There's some uh, thoughts and some things that are yeah okay. Some this is the last one. Uh, some thoughts uh, important. I think uh, one of as I mentioned, one of the benefits of dealing with a mid-sized city is that you have the opportunity to really uh, plan the full network and then start facing uh, the 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 in in different stages. Um, in the case you can not only design the for for the public transport you 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 have the opportunity to do at the same time other projects like the the ones with the related with the bicycles related with pedestrians and other type of interventions that that can uh, uplift the quality and 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 the image of the city uh, definitely for for the case of Rastamari, other cities in South Africa, the full universal access is is crucial, and it has been um, one of the things that we have been following in all all the stages of, the, of this planning process, as well with the NMT scheme. Um, <clears throat> Rastamari has been characterized, or this project in a specific, with a very strong marketing and communication area, uh, which. Uh, have uh, have served to um, to introduce the project not only with the uh, population and get them informed, uh, but help them to participate in a different different type of sessions and 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 approaches that the the the, um, the RRT has with the with the community. And then the last thing that I consider interesting about the the the, the approach that um, Rostrum is having and other cities in South Africa is that they try to uh, start the, pro the project with a full ITS system and a full uh, automatic fare collection since the, since the very beginning. And I think that's uh, one of the the strengths of the project in, in Rostrum. And that's it. Right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll answer any questions now. Paulie probably will do most of that. No, I won't. Okay. Hold on. The first question was, have you considered ideas of an open BRT where feeders form part of the trunk? Yes, when we started, we were very much uh, aligned with state-of-the-art thinking at the time, which was very strongly trunk feeder. Um, we also started with um, with high floor vehicles, that's 940 millimeter boarding, uh, which um, are, are slightly problematic. But as we've gone along and we've, we've noticed in fact that much of our service has uh, had a characteristic of um, heavy loading at the origins, and very little interaction along the line with heavy unloading in the central areas, we have felt that in fact it's more appropriate to have what we call complementary or direct services where you have um, feeder type vehicles uh, linking with the trunk network uh, where you would normally have stations and running along the trunk uh, instead of feeders, as you say, reducing the number of transfers. This, of course, has been facilitated in our later developments in that we are not restricted by having um, high-floor vehicles. We are using low-floor and low-entry vehicles now, which makes it very much easier to pick up passengers on, in our case, the left side at the curb. Remember, we drive on the left-hand side of the road. And then uh, join the, the trunk service and even um, unload and board people on the right-hand side door. So we have these double-sided vehicles which we can use in that mode and that is actually now the favoured mode, what we call complementary and direct services feeding into the, into the trunk services. Perhaps Pauline would like to just add to that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think I think the one thing one does have to take into account in South Africa okay. is that a we don't have the densities that they have, for instance, in in South America. So we put a BRT corridor in, but there's not actually the numbers of people that can walk to that corridor or who live very close to it that you would have um, in really dense cities. Now we're obviously trying to promote that density along the corridor, but it isn't there at the moment. And and with our past spatial development policies and, and the apartheid policies that pushed people out of the cities, people are traveling quite long distances. So um, it, it's not maybe a typical system in that respect until we start building up the densities. So we need to pick up those people at quite long distances and then bring them into a trunk where they become a critical mass and then they go down the trunk at speed. Um, I think that's Okay, and then your second question related to yeah, the application it. of universal access. Uh, you asked us, is it just in the catchment areas um, or, sorry, in the immediate surrounds of the, of, of, of the BRT systems like the stations, the station precincts and that sort of thing. I, I'll leave that to uh, Fabricio to answer, but I, I will come in at the end there. Go on then. Go on. Okay. It's been handed over to me. Um, look, I think to be realistic, we're doing it, I think, within about a 500 meter radius of um, the stations, but then along the routes, wherever we've worked with intersections or anything, um, pedestrian walkways, etc., etc., we've obviously done them to be universally accessible as well. I think just from a from a money point of view, it's you know it's impossible to turn an entire city universally accessible overnight. So we we're starting around the transport system, but I think the the legislation that has come into effect on a national level is going to force cities more and more to spread that universal accessibility um, right across the city. Yeah, look, I think it's important to note that you know in our six seven metropolitan areas. We also have a commuter rail system, which is quite uh, ancient. Um, in fact, more than 50 years in most cases. And that carries quite a significant proportion. In Cape Town, for example, uh, the commuter rail carries nearly half of the total public transport demand. Now, no, that, that system is not universally accessible, and obviously it's going to take quite some time to, to make it uh, so. But what we are actually doing is currently we are refurbi refurbishing, modernizing and upgrading our rail services and we consider this part of our what we call integrated networks. So it's not just BRT, it's any rapid transit system whether it be rail based or road based. But I think the important thing with regard to universal access is we are saying that any new vehicle that's per purchased any any time anywhere in South Africa must be universally accessible. In other words, it must be accessible uh, to people in wheelchairs, um, and it must be supported by people who are partially sighted or hearing disabled, and the whole lot. So, so that is quite important. So, it will be an incremental uh, development. So, it's not just around the BRT. It's it's becoming a um, a system that's that's being implemented throughout the country. S specifically in the case of Rustenburg, other things that are happening is on CBD, which is the most dense area, we are doing uh, a couple of uh, traffic calming measures that are, has a, that are a, a combination of the physical intervention of intersections and the, um, and and putting different elements to 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 improve the, 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 the mobility of the pedestrians and, and of course, uh, wheelchairs and, 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 and all, the people, all the different uh, types of persons that, that need um, um, access. Uh, there's another question. Uh, one second. Okay, I'm going to read the question. You uh, can you talk more about the challenges of the existing land use patterns and average trip distances that need to be covered? Okay, um, 
first of all, we, we've shown you uh, plans and pictures of new systems and plans for new systems. And we wouldn't want to give you a false idea about what public transport looks like in South Africa. Um, I think we need all to understand that, in fact, uh, the market share for public transport is dominated by informal transport in the form of minibus taxis, about 65% market share. These are unscheduled services, um, and they are fairly disorderly. They, they actually uh, resist regulation quite considerably. So, so that is something that we're trying to reform as part of that process. And as we've indicated, um, one of our success stories is that we have now transformed um, around 1,300 to 1,500 former minibus taxi operators into uh, formal business registered bus operating companies. So that, that's really where we're trying to go. We're trying to uh, formalize that. But to talk about the challenges, yes, the main challenges relate to the fact that our cities are uh, sprawling, they cover low densities, uh, they are decentralizing the whole time, and therefore um, the problem that we experience is long distances. In Cape Town, for example, on the route that I showed you, there is a settlement called Atlantis, which was an apartheid town which is 45 kilometers from the center. So, you know, it's not very easy to service uh, a system like that uh, with BRT. Well, first of all, it doesn't need BRT for a large part of the journey because the roads are not congested there. Uh, obviously, you need to provide the BRT at the town end of the system. But even with a BRT, you cannot decrease the uh, trip time so significantly that you can reduce the costs uh, all that significantly. So we acknowledge there are challenges, and as Pauline has indicated, you know, one of the things that we feel BRT could do is act as a catalyst to encourage transit-oriented development and to encourage higher transit use and also to encourage a response from um, the, the private land market to increase densities, particularly where there's a lot of foot traffic and to encourage mixed land use development. We're starting to see it actually happening. Uh, it's happening along the, the Cowtrain corridor between Pretoria and Johannesburg. I um, mean, it, it is happening in Johannesburg and in Cape Town where we've started with BRT. But it is, we agree, it's a major challenge. Well, one can't wish that away. It's going to take decades to, to overcome that problem. And of course, it makes uh, public transport not very viable. It needs subsidy support. And maybe Pauline would like to add to that. Okay. There's another question. Do you think you might have some bus congestion problems on the CBD station, which acts like a hub? In that case, how do you plan to deal with that? <laughs> yeah, it was my idea, yeah. isn't it? Okay. Well, look, uh, yeah, actually, this guy, the, is, this guy is the architect. Uh, yeah, one of the architects. Yeah, I'm no, he's the operational them. network designer as well. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Um, uh, well, Central Station in, in general is, is quite big, and one of the characteristics of the CVD in Rustenburg, which is very particular, is that the streets are very, very wide compared to any street of any historical district or business district in, in, in Latin America. So, so the problems that you, will, you can face in Quito or in Bogota or in Guatemala City is not the case in Rustenburg. It's very, very, very wide, uh, very wide streets, uh, full f uh, four or five lanes uh, street with uh, with sidewalks of three to four meters each side, so there's plenty of space. Um, and, 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 and specifically in the area of, of the central station, um, the, the critical part is the intersection, the two intersections in each side of the of the of the of the of the central station. Um, at the moment. Um, 
Well, look, another another circumstance that is uh, very different is even though it's the CVD of the city, uh, the levels of service are very, very good. We are speaking about levels of service B, um, C, and, and so so there's no actually congestion at all. And, and, and there's a slightly moment of, you can say that it is complicated, at, at peak hour in the morning, but that lasts like 45 minutes to an hour. So, so, so that's so. In our models, um, we got even with the with the full system operating and with the extra faces in the in the in the, in the traffic lights, levels of service D. And and what we have uh, have done is, um, okay, we have uh, we have dedicated faces for the BRT. Which usually increase in one phase the whole the whole the whole intersection times, and um, but uh, we have um, divert some some or well, some of the trips. Um, we have planned that we can divert some of the trips that cross the CBD to other routes uh, outside of the CBD. To put it in a, in a simple way. But, but, but as I said, it's not like the critical thing in, in, in specifically in this project. And that, that's my answer. But I think that, that is quite sort of hypothetical at this stage. Um, practically, in, in Cape Town, where they are operating at the moment, there are problems with their CBD station. It's called Civic, uh, and it terminates at the Civic Center on the eastern periphery of the Central Business District. Um, the problem with that particular station is, as I said, we started with high floor vehicles and the main trunk station consists of, to my knowledge, a double, uh, a double station uh, loading and unloading trunk passengers, but it's had to be extended now to cover the low floor, floor feeder services and there I think there are at least six or seven different bays uh, per direction. So there's quite a long walk between transfers for passengers and again, uh, we're, we're only talking about peak demand of uh, probably around 10,000 at this stage. So yes, we are anticipating some problems. We are not anywhere near the sort of volumes you find in Bogota and many of the South American cities. So any help we can get in that particular arena uh, will be welcome and of, of course we're working on these. We're already starting to see queues build, building up in, in the civic uh, centre. Uh, our, our planners at the moment are saying, no, these are operational problems, but we think they're more than that. Um, and so we're working on them. So that is a very good question. This is Laurel in Santiago. Um, while you're determining if there's more questions, I just wanted to let uh, folks know that our June webinar is going to be on June 26th. And the topic is going to be an, an overview, overview of transit bus emissions in cases of Mexico, Brazil, and India. Transit bus emissions. So that's 11 a.m. Transit, transit bus emissions on June 26th. And I'll be sending out more information to everyone. Thank you. Okay, there's another question. The last one, I think. Can you can you draw any conclusion for more European style cities? Paul, in your turn. What is it in Turkey, say? Can you can you draw any conclusion? Yeah, the last one. Draw any conclusions for more European style cities? Not for last stuff. Okay. Yeah, it's on. Oh, is it on? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right, we've got a question here that says, can you draw any conclusions for more European-style cities? Um, now, I'm not sure if you're asking that we not generalize our stuff to Europe or whether our city should become more European-like. Um, look, we've got completely different types of cities and types of settlements. Uh, um, if I look at South Africa, it's, it's, it's far more Latin America-type development, except without the densities. <laughs> but in terms of... of the informality and the number of informal settlements and so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. And and the sprawl and the yeah. I mean we are a developing country. So I don't think we look we look at the at the at the various systems in Europe, but European cities as a whole are very different from our cities. Um, 
you know, they've, they've developed as, as completely different um, types of spatial development and so on. So, I don't know, Fabrizio, you want to add something? There? Yeah, um, maybe me coming from other latitude. <laughs> um, I think, uh, well, that some, uh, well, definitely, uh, there's uh, as, as an, uh, as a different from 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 Europe, the, the the approach here is very 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 pro vehicle. There's, there's the concept of using public transportation is very reduced scale, and even that you know, the the majority of the people still use public transportation. is is completely different from other 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 places in Latin America or or Europe. I mean, uh, all this um, you 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 heard me speak about the taxi industry, and Basically, the taxi industry is a, is a, is a group of um, mini bands that, that that goes everywhere, which is quite different from the the, the, for the most of the cities in Latin America oh, or yeah. Europe. So um, I think um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to extra, extrapolate any, any anything back there. Um, I think what what is important, uh, I, I would say the probably the, the the approach with the with the population is a is a is something that you can that you can learn from here because it's, it's very um the, the possibility of uh, um, i mean the, everything that we are proposing here about uh brt and about uh, public transportation is quite new not only the brt is in general the concept of public transportation is quite new I mean, in, in the sense that we understand this understand in other places so um, I think that's give you certain possibility to be sometimes a little bit more creative in, what, in some things uh, the, the, on the other hand what just makes a big difference is that, that the city is really all the cities are really sprawl so this is, this is a challenge a quite challenge to have uh, systems that are profitable or or systems that are sustainable, and I think this is the main challenge that South Africa and other cities uh, and South Africa has. And well, no, probably I didn't answer the question, but yeah, look, I, I really think uh, our biggest problem is the fact that uh, you know um, the aspiration for most people living in cities is to own and use motor cars. And while we don't have a uh, viable um, and quality public transport systems, we cannot practice car restraint. We cannot do congestion charging. We cannot do the sort of things that you can do in Europe or even Latin America where you have a viable, effective public transport system and network so that, in fact, uh, you can practice uh, car restraint measures. So we, we, we need to learn, first of all, to build our public transport systems and then to support it by means of car restraint because otherwise um, the system is, is going to run away with us. And in fact, that's what we have experienced in the last 20 years. Because of this aspiration to own cars, our cities have tended to disperse, sprawl, experience de, uh, de decentralization which makes it really like Los Angeles, you know, we can't, public transport can't keep up with that sort of lack of control over land development. So, so really this is a last minute desperate attempt to rein in uh, unsustainable uh, suburban sprawl uh, and low density urban development. But if you, if you remember what Fabrizio said earlier, if you take a sort of secondary city of like Rustenburg that's still under a million population, now that's is the time place. to get in there and do the public transport system because as you saw, 80% of the people there do not own cars. Um, but all of those 80% are aspiring to own cars and you know, as wages increase and so on and so forth, they all go out and buy their first car. Um, so now is the time to intervene in a city like that. It's very difficult already to intervene in the big metropolitan areas, but the opportunity lies to to try to at least slow down the movement of cars in, in a city like Rustenburg. Okay, thank you.
I see. Good luck, Carl. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. <laughs> You're more than welcome to visit whenever you want. <laughs> Very different, but nice. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all so much for presenting and everyone for attending. And um, we'll be sending out the slides next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a lovely weekend. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>